Governor Rauner is back from Europe, and Mike Madigan gets another term as chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they might just affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. The legislature has been very busy. Boy, I was at the State House uh, before this taping, and there were people swarming all over the place. Anyway, uh, with me today to discuss things particularly in the state, Charlie Wheeler is back. He is director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. Long time Chicago Sun Times State House reporter before that. Charlie, welcome. Thank you, Bernie. It's always fun to be here. And, and a new addition to the show, although a, a, a experienced reporter in her own right, Dusty Rhodes is with us today. She is education reporter for NPR Illinois, also known as WUIS, uh, and used to be with Illinois Times some years back. So, Dusty, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bernie. Well, uh, guns are an issue that has uh, been of s a lot of importance in the country, you know, with school shootings and other mass shootings in recent years. Uh, there was a, a bit of, um, well, there, there were a lot of gun owners, thousands, who came to Springfield this week to march uh, on Gun Owners Lobby Day, iGold, uh, basically saying, we want what the governor did to stand, which is the governor had vetoed a bill um, pushed by Senator Don Harmon of Oak Park, which would have had Illinois license uh, smaller gun dealers, gun shops uh, in the state through a state agency, in addition to the federal licensing they have now. Ultimately, Senator Harmon uh, did not call for an override. He, I think uh, his statements were that he thought he probably had enough votes in the Senate to override, uh, but probably that would not happen in the House. Charlie, uh, uh, Illinois has, the gun owners have been a pretty strong uh, political force in Illinois, even though before concealed carry was something that the U.S. Supreme Court said Illinois had to join in on. The Chicago area in particular was a very uh, strong gun control area. Um, where is Illinois today, and do you think any gun legislation will happen this spring? I think it's possible that some legislation will happen. Um, it was no surprise that Senator Harmon chose not to seek the override. The, he had eight senators who didn't vote on the issue the first time around, so he could have convinced enough of them to get the 36 they needed for the override. But in the House, it only received 64 votes. It needed seven more affirmatives, and there were only two, two House members who didn't vote the first time around. And you need 71 to override. Right, yeah. and so the likelihood of getting five people who are already down there voting no to suddenly switch to support the override was non-existent. And now what Senator Harmon has said he's going to do is he's going to try and work with s different people, try and negotiate, try and figure out. Uh, one of the objections that the business community had was this is unfair because it only applies to small businesses, people like, uh, you know, large stores that, the, you know, the super stores can still do it. So maybe yeah, he in will other add words, those. In other words, if, if gun sales are not a, a really big part of your sales, so if you're a big box store, then you wouldn't have come under this yeah, state you, regulation. Yeah, you would have come under this. It, and he said maybe one of the things we can do is we can include everybody. Um, and he is going to try again. One of the interesting things about the legislature is that a particular bill number might die, and this bill number is dead. But the idea is still alive, and it can be amended at some later date to another piece of legislation. Nothing is ever dead in Springfield until they end the session for real. <laughs> well, n nothing is ever dead, ever. Uh, the person who sponsored that did it for like 15 years in a row before it went through. Yeah, and I remember when they were trying to ban smoking from public buildings. That took many, many years, too. Yeah. Dusty, mm -hmm. I know you've been watching on this gun issue. The governor, while he has been attacked, for example, by J.B. Pritzker, his Democratic opponent, who says, you know, I would have signed this bill that Don Harmon, the senator from Oak Park, pushed forward for licensing gun dealers. And, you know, with all this violence going on, Bruce Rauner doesn't care. Bruce Rauner says it's, it's too tough on business. Uh, we've got to protect our schools. We've got to get work on mental health issues, and he also has a task force operating, and I think you've been going to some meetings, so does it look like that within the next several weeks of session, before the end of session this spring, is that going to uh, develop some legislation, do you think, and can you tell the direction? Um, yeah, um, so I went to the first couple of meetings, and I, f I feel like I snuck in. <laughs> I, I 
did not see any other media there. Um, well, thanks for being there for us. Well, <laughs> now I've blown my cover. Um, so it's it's run by Roger Heaton, the formal, former uh, what, federal prosecutor. Yeah, he was U.S. Attorney in Springfield US and now Attorney. Chief of Staff to the Governor. Right, and um, uh, Risley, is it Dave Risley? Um, it it's, uh, might be a prosecutor another federal prosecutor. Who worked with him for like right, 25 years. In the Springfield office. And mm -hmm. then Mike Chamness from the Illinois Terrorism Task Force. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason that I really uh, wanted to sneak in on the first one was because they were talking about school safety. And they had had a, a different working group that met before this one. Um, and so they already had this list of 13 ideas for how to protect schools. Um, they were very um, kind of John Wayne ideas. Yeah. Does it include like getting more guards, like hiring off duty? It's it's hardening police? hardening, and mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of you know hardening the facilities, which I think they estimated would cost 3.6 billion. Wow. Uh, Which means they're not doing all of that right now. <laughs> well, well, I mean, they said some of it's already done. The, that estimate would assume that none of it had been done, mm -hmm. so this was, um, you know, the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it was a lot of uh, assessment, tas assessment teams so that people would kind of get together and say, let's keep an eye on this kid right. um, kind of thing. And the, of the 13, number 13 was... Um, trauma training, um, which which is what on the education beat I hear about all the time, kind of just intervening with kids who have trauma in their lives mm -hmm. and how if you can do that first, you might avoid. <laughs> another, another <laughs> so in other words, other words, if you got a troubled kid, maybe yes. they can figure out who that is and get help to them, which is kind of the mental health there you go. part of it. Okay. So that was the number 13 mm -hmm. thing. I mean, it was funny in, as it was discussed in the room because the, um, you know, like I said, it was kind of a John Wayne task working group and the female legislators in the room kind of spoke up with all these ideas and Risley kept saying, you guys ought to be on this working group. You guys. <laughs> and so... I, it, at least they were open to some ideas that don't cost three point six million yeah. dollars. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> so certainly keep an eye on because I think. Yeah. Well, it, it, it occurs to me that probably the one bill that's most likely to pass would uh, impose a ban on bump stocks and trigger cranks. These are mm -hmm. devices that turn a, a semi-automatic weapon or a normal weapon, I guess, in, into a military-grade assault weapon. The reason I say it's got a good chance is it's because it, it, it was a House bill. It got 83 affirmative votes when it went through the House the first time. It went to the Senate, had some minor changes, got 37 votes in the Senate. Yeah. Now it's back for the House to agree to those changes. Both of those numbers are higher than what it would take to override a veto. And if Governor Rauner, as he said in the aftermath of the override being called off, that he wants to do something, this seems to me like a, a perfect uh, example of what he could do. Right. I, yeah, I think it's it, e even a lot of gun owners are talking about, you know, bump stocks after the Las Vegas shooting yeah. when there was this machine gun kind of shooting at people at a concert. Um, it, that would be nothing as easy in the political world, but that would be perhaps an, an easier thing to pass. That yeah, what, what's, what's the old cliche, the low-hanging fruit? Yeah. yeah. So, I, I so something will happen, but maybe not what probably the not Don a Harmons of, want. a lot of deer hunters who go out with bump stocks. <laughs> yeah, I don't <laughs> think so. Um, obviously, as you know, we move in through the spring session, uh, while things haven't always been that way during this current governor's term, but passing a state budget is usually what always happens because <laughs> we went two years without uh, until the tax increase last last summer. Um, but on a budget issue, Comptroller uh, Susana Mendoza came out with a report, Charlie, that showed that because there uh, is such a backlog of bills over time that have built up at sometimes as high as I believe $16 billion, uh, it's down to I think about eight now, uh, but the state, if it doesn't pay bills by I think within 90 days, they start there's a penalty, uh, and the, the amount of penalty is 1% per month mm -hmm. uh, that is supposed to be on, on past due bills. And the Mendoza report showed that uh, since uh, July 2015, uh, it's been, I think, um, $1.14 billion has accrued in uh, back in penalty payments that will have to be made. And in the previous 
time that, since that law was enacted, 1998 to 2015, it was even less than that, just over a billion. So uh, take it all together. Yeah, and, and and there's been some more talk about should a governor. There's legislation. Um, David McSweeney, a state representative from uh, uh, the Barrington area, has legislation that's moving through the House, and there's Tom Cullerton has it in the Senate that says a, a governor would have to include a projected penalty late payment penalty uh, penalties in a proposed budget. So um, how bad is this and what's the solution? Well, I think it, it is bad and, and it was worse in Governor Rauner's first three years than it was going back to the turn of the century, all those governors before him, Republican and Democrat. And the problem is we went without a budget, but we didn't stop spending. Some money goes out because the law says it has to go out, budget or no pension payments, debt service, you know, repaying the bonds that we've, that we've sold for different projects. Uh, the court said you have to pay state workers' salaries. Right, without an appropriation. There's no, although there's no appropriation. Right. We've entered in over the years into a lot of agreements to settle federal court suits brought by advocates for people who rely on human services where we, the state, didn't say, well, we're not doing what we're supposed to. We didn't admit that, but we said, oh, in the future, we'll do it and there are dollars associated with that. Those continue to be paid out. Better than 90% of the standard budget continued to go out, and it went out at levels that the revenues couldn't sustain. Right. And so we went on like this for 700 plus days before we finally got a budget in place with a tax increase. That's enabled us to bring that backlog down from 16, 17 billion, well, basically to cut it in half to roughly right. 8 billion. Yeah, I, I should say that uh, Governor Rauner, who is back from a, a trip he took to Poland and Germany, uh, was asked about C Comptroller Mendoza saying uh, this about the backlog, and he called, he, he used the word baloney. He does that a lot. This is baloney. She was in the legislature and voted, you know, for some of the budgets that have caused the problem we have now back when she was a, a legislator. So there's going to be some political sniping back and forth as well. Yeah, and, and you can argue that, well, Comptroller Mendoza is doing this to embarrass the governor, but you can't argue with the numbers. The numbers are what the numbers are. So, for example, for him to say we haven't had a balanced budget for 30 years, that's flat out demonstrably wrong. But if people don't pay attention to this stuff, because it is kind of dry and boring, um, they'll say, oh, yeah, Governor, we're with you. you we've got to get rid of those evil lawmakers. <laughs> Scoundrels and rascals. <laughs> he did call them rascals. <laughs> Dusty, one of the things the governor has been very protective of, even like in the first year when, no f when the legislature passed a full budget he didn't like, he vetoed it all except education. And then this last year, uh, when the legislature revised the funding formula to help schools that are struggling to make things more equitable across the system, uh, the governor not only kind of reversed himself being opposed to some of the funding levels and being for it, but he's taking a credit for that change in the formula as one of his big accomplishments. He Our vetoed that first. He vetoed, yeah, he vetoed don't it Don't skip over that part. I, he vetoed that's that. That's why you're here, to keep us <laughs> honest. So, um, are the schools, I, I think it was just a few weeks ago we, we got the announcement that schools are now seeing funding under the new formula. Is that happening? Are they happy? Is, are, I assume this doesn't mean all problems in education are solved, but at least it, it's a, a, at least perhaps more equitable in the way state dollars that are available are being distributed? Um, yeah, it's, it's like turning a tanker, you know, but um, it's kind of a, pathetic. <laughs> Everybody's happy about it, but in a way it's kind of pathetic because, uh, you know, this equity piece, the 3.66 million is right, what it is. Added. Yeah, it's, um, and some of that was just left over from the uh, base funding. Um, the 6%. Right, it's not it's not a lot of funding compared to the need out there. Uh, right, and I remember when it was brought up in the, in the uh, Governor's Commission, you know, I think it was Senator Andy Menard did a quick calculation in his head and says, okay, at this rate, we'll get to equity in 18 years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, a, a kid born now. At the end of high school, maybe they're <laughs> yeah, younger and brothers and, and, and sisters. You know, but the other thing it did was it just shone a light on just how far apart they are. You know, some a lot of districts have less than half the funding they need yeah. and some what, what have almost three times. What is the range now? Is it still like certain downstate or rural districts will get what per student? Like is it in the $7,000 a year range? When you count in the local property taxes, it's 
pretty substantial. Yeah, it's probably more than that, isn't it? No, I mean, I mean at like thirty thousand dollars per student in some of the suburbs, compared to oh, like downstate? seven or eight thousand downstate. Yeah, and and obviously you can Heard. buy more uh, people to teach uh, advanced placement courses when you ha when you're spending the higher dollars. Do you know what an IEP is? An individual educate individualized education plan. Right for uh, for students that need special help. For students who need special help, or for students who are in that district that had was. Thirty-two thousand students per thirty-two thousand dollars per year mm -hmm. per student. <laughs> I mean, and they, they do they, they, they do better. They made an IEP for each student. Oh, is that right? Until yes. Well, that is different. That's, and uh, that's every little special. Okay. But I would say, in, in defense <laughs> of this program, uh, the way it works is that next year everybody will get the same as they did this year. And so those districts that are sharing in that three hundred fifty million, whatever the very poorest district, that will be part of their base. And if they're not up to what the level that the new complicated formula says they should be getting, then they will share in a part of the next $350 million and so on until, as Senator Menard said, 18 years from now, finally everybody will be up where they're supposed to be if, you know, knock on wood, if we're able to follow this program for that long. And we will be watching that. I did mention at the uh, introduction to the show that the governor was recently in Poland and Germany. He's back in the States. He was in Chicago. He had a press conference saying uh, one thing that he had announced from Germany is that there's going to be like a trade show, which we knew was coming to, I think it's McCormick Place or to Chicago, but it's, it will be coming soon. And he's, he also said he expects some other projects to be announced as they are developed. So the Democrats are saying, oh, look, all he came back with was a trade show he announced before. And he's saying we have promise of stuff in the future. Trips like this worth it over time, Charlie? Do you think he'll get something good out of this? Will we see some yeah, results? I, I think we will. And I think it's not really fair to criticize him at this point because it takes a while to put this stuff together. You know, if come November there are no fruits to show for this, then you can say, yeah, it was a stunt. But let's say some German company announces uh, three weeks from today that we're, they're going to build a facility somewhere. Um, That'll lift the town. Yeah. That'll do a good thing. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, one of uh, the other things that happened in the last week is the Democratic Party of Illinois at a meeting at a hotel in Springfield, the, the new State Central Committee. A lot of uh, members that were there before, but some new ones. And guess who they elected as chairman for the <laughs> sixth four-year term? Um, Mike Madigan, who's also Speaker of the House since like 1993. So he's been chairman of the party since uh, 1998. Uh, there was some thought with sexual harassment allegations against Democratic Party of Illinois and some other political groups on that side. Uh, and as Charlie, I know you have said on shows before, it's really not a, a, a partisan thing. <laughs> there, this exists in, in other places Unfortunately. too. But Mike Madigan got, you know, had to dismiss a couple of his political operatives from working on campaigns because of allegations against them, either of bullying or of um, sexual harassment, un unwanted advances. Um, and he uh, announced at this meeting that uh, every staffer and volunteer for his organizations are now going to have to go through sexual harassment training. Uh, and uh, he got 35 out of 36 votes for another term as speaker because there wasn't a serious challenge that ended up uh, to him. Uh, and the one person who voted against him was a guy named Peter Janko from Marengo. He's a Bernie Sanders Democrat who told me later that you know, some of the uh, opposition to try to elect the person who had been on the committee before made him look, paint him like a Republican, which he's really not. Uh, and he started to promise people he wouldn't be voting for Madigan for speaker. But I don't know if th what this says about Madigan's uh, political skills, but before the 1 p.m. meeting, they had lunch together, just Janko and Madigan. And then that afternoon, they appeared on a sh uh, Chicago um, progressive radio station, a, a very Democratic station. Uh, together by phone talking about how they're going to try to work out their differences and how at least they both agree we should work to beat Bruce Rauner and other Republicans. Dusty, I guess there's no big change at the State House with Mike Madigan in charge of the party and the House. Uh, uh, some things just don't change, you know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I th I'm waiting for the limerick <laughs> about Peter Django from yeah. Marengo. Their Charli song. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, with the name. Uh, yeah. Charlie, um, Governor Rauner and the Republican Party, uh, they have made Mike Madigan their punching bag for a number of years. Uh, Governor Rauner again today was calling Pritzker, the, it's Pritzker, it's Madigan, they're all corrupt, he uses corrupt. I actually asked Speaker Madigan uh, at this event, 
you know, he calls you corrupt all the time. You've not been charged with anything, which I also point out to Rauner when I ask it. You know, what do you think of that? And he just said, that's just the way Bruce Rauner is. He has to blame somebody for something, and I think voters this year will be tired of it and will throw him out. I don't know uh, if you want to predict the election yet, <laughs> but uh, is the fact that Madigan is still at the top of the Democratic Party, does that give Rauner hope and a chance <laughs> to win a re-election in what looks like a, a good Democratic year? Well, there was a national report that came out just a few days ago that said Bruce Rauner is the incumbent governor most in danger of losing. And I don't follow the other states. I have a hard enough time trying to keep up with Illinois. But I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, if he had a whole lot of accomplishments to run on and to brag about, he wouldn't have to hammer Madigan. He wouldn't have to paint everybody who runs against them as being Madigan's tool. He did it with Jeannie Ives in the primary. He, well, he, he's calling Senator Sam McCann, who, right, is, who, is a who wants to be a conservative party. Right. He, uh, that's a third-party candidate. Yeah, under yeah the he's a pawn manner. of Mike Madigan. Yeah, he, yeah, and then... I mean, if you had something good to say about yourself, you wouldn't have to attack your opponents, I think. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Actually, Sam McCann, uh, in response to Governor Rauner saying that, said the real pawn of Mike Madigan is Bruce Rauner because he's done all these liberal things that Chicago <laughs> Democrats like Mike Madigan want, including expanding abortion rights and, and stuff like well, that. Well, that was one of the ironies because uh, Rauner hammered Ives for being basically a tool of Madigan, and yet what prompted Ives to run was Rauner signing bills that Madigan pushed through the House right. and that Ives voted against. Right, on abortion. Although in Madigan's precinct, mm -hmm. she did carry uh, Rauner, or yeah, Ives beat Rauner in Madigan's precinct six to one. Oh, now, <laughs> now that, that wasn't a percentage, that was exactly it. There were six people voted for <laughs> G.D. Ives, one person voted for Bruce <laughs> Rauner. But as you can figure, Madigan's precinct doesn't have a lot of Republican no, voters. No, I, I don't think it would. And in that part of Chicago. Um, Dusty, using, just I know you concentrate on education. Uh, there is uh, a movement in the legislature to kind of separate campuses, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, Southern Univers Illinois University um, Edwardsville. Um, and of course, Southern has a, a medical school already based in Springfield, and there's been talk of Southern establishing at least the third year of their law school in Springfield. There have been some uh, entreaties to the city to consider possibly um, building or opening a facility here to extend Southern's law school to Springfield. What's the sat status of that uh, possible split in campuses? Do we have any idea if it will happen? I've heard, I mean, I've only been covering education for three years now, but I've heard that, um, that this has come up multiple times in the past, um, but this time it feels different. Um, it and in these committees where I've been hearing this discussed, it feels very intense. Um, and it's, you know, it's because actually in the fall, there's a real good chance that Edwardsville will have a larger enrollment than Carbondale. Now that would see change. And, yeah. and Carbondale gets more money than Edwardsville. And, you know, I, I was talking to a, um, our reporter in Carbondale and she said, this t tends to bubble up whenever economic times get tough. And it's like, you know, it's like a marriage that hangs together <laughs> until things get rough and then mom and dad split up. And, and this time it may be really to, you know, the, uh, Randy Dunn, the president of, the, of SIU is- S is The whole system. Yeah. He's staying rigorously neutral. Mm -hmm. The board is allegedly neutral, although I'm not sure if the board is neutral or equally divided. Um, so, uh, you know, Dunn will be out of a job if, if this yeah. happens. Yeah. Well, it, it, this interestingly comes at a time, Charlie, maybe you can comment, but I, I saw a letter from somewhere from Tom Cross or a statement uh, who's chairman of the Board of Higher Education, former Republican leader of the Illinois House, talking about maybe it's time f to uh, put one big board over all of higher education or something uh, of that sort. And I know the governor has talked about we have too much duplication. So. And, and during the two-year budget impasse, higher education really got starved of a lot of funds, and uh, there were a lot of layoffs in places, and, and communities were really worried, and we, we hear about poaching of our professors from University of Illinois, from Texas, and other places. Uh, are we looking at a possible realignment in higher ed, or where does this, I guess maybe it depends who gets elected governor this time. I don't think it's going to happen. It doesn't matter who the governor is. Because and the reason I say that is uh, the University of Illinois, and I work for a part of it, the Springfield campus, 
the Champaign campus is not going to cede its authority to some super group. It's covered by the Board of Higher Education, but there's a lot of autonomy there. And U of I, you're an alumnus, right? I am, from Champaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, has got, I don't know, you know, cabillion alums all around that would rally to its support. I <laughs> didn't think that we're going to see a split between Edwardsville and Carbondale, because this is an issue that has nothing to do with partisan politics. It's all about regional stuff. All the lawmakers from the Metro East want to do it. All the lawmakers from Southern Illinois don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a lawmaker from anywhere else, I don't want to get in the middle of that <laughs> fight. <laughs> so and so and one of them from Southern, from Carbondale is Cullerton. President Cullerton? Ta yeah. Of the Senate. John Cullerton. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, an interesting media thing, and Charlie, I'll go back to your uh, expertise and background. The Chicago Sun-Times one day this week ran a blank front page. Uh, they're owned now by a consortium of like unions, and the, but the head of the Sun Times is Edwin Eisendrath, who's a former uh, alderman, alderman from Chicago. He ran for governor once uh, in a primary against Rod Blagojevich, uh, saying he would be more honest, and it didn't wasn't able to beat the Blagojevich machine at that time. Yeah, well, what, what do you think? Looking of back on it, that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Eisendrath is now you know making some moves. This was basically a play to say. Uh, news, it costs money to produce news in, in real news outlets. You know, subscribe to us, please. You think this was a, a good idea for the paper that you spent how many years with? 20 uh, some? 24, but mm -hmm. my father was there 32 years before me. So mm -hmm. <laughs> for like 50 some years of my life, I, all my expenses were paid for directly by or indirectly the Chicago by Sun the Chicago Sun Times. Yeah. Yeah. I <coughs> excuse me. I, I think it's important that there'd be competition in Chicago. It'd be important that, for example, the SGR continues and that some owner doesn't come in and decide to gut the paper, milk it for all it's worth, and then dump it. That's happened in a lot of cities when these private investor groups come in, grab up a newspaper. They don't realize there's a community responsibility. It's not just about making money because you're not putting out dog food or soap flakes. You're providing the information that people need to rely on to be informed citizens. Right, and I, I, I should just put in a plug, there are so many new news sites in Illinois, some of them are politically based. There's something called the Sangamon Sun that political activist Dan Proft puts out. There are 29 sites like that around the state. The Illinois Policy Institute has the Illinois News Network, which you can question their motives even though they do some good work. Um, <laughs> but the real old style media, we try to play it straight, I think, I certainly do, and I know we do too. I think we're out of time. We'll talk about that some other time. Charlie Wheeler and Dusty Rhodes, thanks for joining me. I'm Bernie Schoenberg. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Capital View.